Thank you very much, Holly, for that introduction. That was very kind of you. And thank you again, Chris, for being such a good host. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, but I'll just share my screen now, and I hope that you'll all be able to see it. There we are. Is that good, Chris? Can you see that? 100%. Lovely. Over to you. Thanks, Sia. OK, perfect. Um, thank you very much. So um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here tonight. Um, I hope you enjoy this talk. <laughs> so I just want to say a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Kenya on the shores of Lake Naivasha, which is where I first developed my passion for wildlife. And um, I've got some really fond memories of going on safari and stopping on the road to watch some really determined little dung beetles trying to go over some pretty crazy obstacles um, and sometimes helping them along the way. So I've just always been really fascinated by them. And um, I jumped at the chance to study them for my master's. And um, unfortunately, this talk isn't actually really related to my thesis, but if anybody has any questions, then I'd be happy to answer them at the end. Um, this talk is really just an opportunity for me to share my passion with you and maybe impart some knowledge that hopefully you didn't know before. Um, I haven't had that much time to prepare. Um, I'm more of a stand in and I'm not an expert by any means. Um, but I do really hope you enjoy this presentation and I hope I'll be able to answer most of your questions at the end. So first of all, what are dung beetles? Um, well, I'm sure you all know that dung beetles eat dung um, or, or in other words, are coprophagous. Um, some species actually do feed on other things sort of like detritus or rotting meat even. And in this talk, I'll be addressing the following five things which I really think are incredible about dung beetles, um, and I hope that maybe some of which you didn't know. So first of all, the different types of dung beetles, um, their global distribution, the incredible ways in which they navigate, um, and the importance of dung beetles in terms of the environment, but also their importance for humans as well. And finally, some of the, threat, the threats that they're sadly facing. So as with many species, um, there's more than one type of dung beetle. Um, they're generally grouped into three main functional groups, and this is dependent on their reproductive strategies. And then within those functional groups, there are also some divisions as well, and these are known as coprids. So a large majority of coprophagous species in the dung beetle family actually belong to a single genus, and this genus is called Aphodius. It comprises about 1,650 species, um, and most of these species are actually really tiny, like less than 10 millimeters in length. So these are generally the, the species that you, found in, you find in northern temperate regions, sort of cooler climates, um, which is why their presence in these regions, it, regions is sort of overlooked. Um, you won't actually see 90% of the dung beetles unless you're willing to get your hands a little bit dirty. <laughs> um, so as the name suggests, these guys carry out their entire life cycle within dung pats themselves. So this is mating, development of the eggs, larvae, pupa, everything. Um, so in other sense, they dwell in the dung. And um, although they're small, these particular group of dung beetles actually prefer large herbivore dung and um, the fresher, the better. <laughs> And the second group are called tunnelers, also known as paracoprids. So as their name suggests, these species actually dig tunnels underneath the dung, the dung pats. And um, because of this, they often carry some pretty impressive headgear, like you can see this species on the screen called Anthophagus taurus. Um, and this functional group of dung beetles is actually usually divided into um, large and small tunnelers. Um, so the large tunnelers are usually bigger than about 13 millimeters. Um, they're often nocturnal actually, and they do carry out some parental care, which is pretty cool. So with this species, these um, genera, usually mating occurs within the dung pat. And then after this, the females are usually the ones who dig the tunnels directly underneath the dung pats, and then that's where they pull the dung down. And um, they're often referred to as burrows, actually, these holes. But something that's really incredible about this is they actually mark their individual burrows with scent markers, which helps the dung beetles themselves to be able to recognize their own burrows and also acts as a repellent to other dung beetles. 
Now, ball rollers, um, specifically telecoprids, are what you might call the quintessential dung beetles. It's what we think of whenever we think of a dung beetle. And the dung balls they roll are called brood balls, or they actually can sometimes be called nuptial balls because some species of um, the males will use the ball to impress the female, sort of like a wedding gift. And um, they kind of provide nutrients to the growing larvae, sort of like a growing chick inside an egg. And the different interactions between males and females during the making and transporting of these dung balls can be known as active or passive partnerships, depending on who's doing the hard work. So the breeding and nesting habits, or basically what happens to these brood balls, differs a lot between different species. And um, Hansky and Camerfort are the authors of a book called The Ecology of Dung Beetles, and they defined five distinct nesting pattern types. Um, I've just listed some examples of the genera that you might find characteristic of each type on the screen um, for each type. And as you can see, dung beetles tend not to have the most simple names to pronounce. <laughs> So the first type is where mating occurs at the food source and then the female alone is the one who transports berries and makes the dung herself. And then the second type is where males will take a little bit more of an active role in actually making the ball, but then the females take charge by shaping the ball into whatever shape they want, which can often be sort of more than one pear shaped ball out of the big ball, which is kind of an evolved trait to save them going back and forth from the dung pile to make their nests. And then the third type is where females will construct multiple balls and actually care for their offspring until they emerge, which is usually means that they only breed once a season, often sometimes once a year even. And then the fourth type is where the female and male um, bury the balls together in the same nest, and then they bring up multiple balls to that nest and both the female and the male show parental care. And then finally, some species of rollers have actually just dropped ball rolling altogether. Um, this could be due to reduced competition. If there's a lot of dung around, they don't really need to stash away their own little piece. And um, sometimes as well, depending on what dung types are available, if they come in little pellets, they really are already in little balls convenient for rolling, so they don't need to bother. And um, I'm sure you all know that the animal kingdom is full of lazy beings looking to take the easy way out, which brings me to another type of ball rolling beetle, and these are called kleptocoprids. And um, basically their sole purpose is to steal ready-made balls that the telecoprids have worked really hard to make. Um, this can lead to some pretty fierce combat between the males of the same species, but also interspecifically as well, which is amazing. Um, and I know Chris was mentioning earlier about watching dung beetles fight. I don't know if anyone has ever had that pleasure, but they're pretty strong for their size and they can be pretty hectic. <laughs> So the second incredible thing about dung beetles is their global distribution. Um, I found that the global distribution of dung beetles is something that often surprises people um, because I guess most people assume that you only really find dung beetles on the African savannas. Um, but when you're looking at finding dung beetles in the world, it really helps to think about what the limitations are. So really, you only need two things, which is a suitable climate and dung. And if you think about it, <laughs> it's plausible for these dung beetles to exist basically everywhere in the world because they meet that criteria. Um, so if I can just draw your attention to the map on the screen, I apologize if um, the little zoom boxes might be covering it a little bit. But basically, it just shows the six main biogeographical regions where you find dung beetles. Um, and then within the 45 degree lines, north and south, is the bracket within which you find the most dung beetles. So that really is in the tropics. But as you can see, dung beetles are really on every continent except Antarctica, which I guess a lot of people were surprised about. And um, in total, there are about 6,000 species in the world, 2,000 in Africa, but there are even 60 species of dung beetles just in the UK, which a lot of my friends had no idea even existed. <laughs> and the third and possibly the most incredible thing about dung beetles is the way they navigate. So if you think about dung beetles as having brains about the size of a grain of rice, um, but they can do things that you and I couldn't even possibly entertain. And um, the answer to how exactly beetles can navigate in straight lines and successfully arrive at their destinations, despite a lot of confusions along the way, has been sought after for many years. 
Um, so dung beetles under the umbrella of the sacred scarab beetles, um, they've been worshipped by in Egyptian culture for centuries. And this is basically because they sort of conjured up these images of a giant dung beetle rolling the sun across the sky from sunrise to sunset. And what we now know, in fact, is that it's the exact opposite is true, which is that the sun is what dictates the movement of the dung beetles and not the other way around. So this is also true for the moon and the stars, like those in the Milky Way. And this is because dung beetles are using what's known as a celestial compass to navigate. So studies have shown that when a human is blindfolded, we're basically really unable to maintain a steady course and we just start walking in smaller and smaller circles. And for a dung beetle, the equivalent of being blindfolded would be to be in complete darkness constantly. But as a researcher, you really can't always guarantee those conditions. Um, so scientists have come up with numerous methods of preventing the dung beetles from being able to pick up these cues to really test if this is what they're using. Um, and this includes fitting them with tiny broad brimmed, broad brimmed hats, as you can see on the left there, um, but also by really changing the position of the sun and the moon using shading and artificial lighting and mirrors as well. Um, and so when dung beetles are denied access to these cues, they actually do a similar thing to humans and they actually end up not going in a straight line at all, but usually circling back to where they started, which obviously is not a good idea because they end up encountering their ball thieving relatives. So there are many, many researchers who've looked into understanding how dung beetles navigate, um, but Marcus Byrne and his colleague, colleagues have done a lot and they've actually discovered quite a bit about dung beetles by doing some pretty simple um, um, experiments. And I'm going to talk a little bit about these investigations, um, which they did on ball road. It's just really to illustrate how they kind of worked it all out. Um, I would really encourage you to look at Marcus's TED talk. It's called The Dance of the Dung Beetles and it's really fascinating. Um, so dung is an incredibly valuable resource to dung beetles. And obviously in that case, dung beetles want to really transport their dung, beetle, their dung balls away from the dung, the dung pile as soon as possible to avoid competition. And the best way to do this is to head in a straight line directly away from it. Um, and if you've ever seen a dung beetle rolling their balls, you can really see that they do know exactly where they want to go. So Marcus and co investigated this by placing dung beetles and their balls onto circular boards, which they could rotate to different differing degrees. And basically what they found out is no matter how many degrees the dung beetles were disorientated from the way they were originally going, they always worked out they were going and went straight in the right direction. So it basically they established that yes, dung beetles do indeed know where they're going. So the next question was, well, how did they know where they're going? What are they using to navigate and to orientate themselves? So an obvious cue would be the sun. Um, and Marcus and his colleagues again conducted some experiments. And what they did was essentially move the position of the sun by using shading and mirrors to reflect the sun in the opposite direction. And what they observed was that the dung beetles reacted by promptly turning around and going back the other way. Another potential cue that they could have been using was polarized light, which is actually something that humans can't see most of the time. Um, and again, Marcus and his colleagues, they tested for this by using polarization filters, which they placed at right angles to the actual polarization. And basically what they witnessed was really interesting. What they found was that the dung beetle would travel underneath the filter and then turn 90 degrees and carry on in that direction until it came from out from underneath the filter, and then it would reorientate to exactly the way it was going before, which is pretty cool. And using polarized light has actually been discovered to be really important for forest dung beetles, especially because they have a hard time seeing a lot of the other celestial cues under the forest canopy. So it has also been demonstrated that nocturnal dung beetles can use a range of celestial cues, and these include the moon and the Milky Way, um, between which they can actually alternate depending on what's most useful or what's readily available at the time. Um, which you think about it is absolutely amazing given how tiny their eyes are. <laughs> so um, it's really clear from all of these simple experiments and many more that dung beetles are using these celestial components to navigate. 
And then the next question that people were thinking was, well, how on earth do they manage this when they spend most of their time with their face on the ground? So that brings me to what's fondly known as the dance of the dung beetle, which is basically a behavior that involves the dung beetle stopping, running up to the top of its ball, looking around, spinning around, and then going back down. And they somehow in this small time work out where they want to go. So through various investigations and observations of dung beetle behavior, it has been established that this dance is what the dung beetle is using to orientate themselves. Um, as well as also being potentially important in cooling themselves down, because I'm sure spending most of your time face down on the African savannah can get quite hot. But then again, how in this fraction of a second do they reorientate themselves? So one theory that's been suggested is called the celestial snapshot theory. Um, and this has really recently been proposed in a paper by El Jindi and colleagues that was published in 2021. And this theory essentially suggests that the dung beetles can take a mental picture of the sky at the beginning of their journey, which they match to the view of the sky as they progress. So if what they see above them doesn't match their stored image in their mind, then they just spin around until it does and carry on. And um, these celestial snapshots can include the position of the sun, the position of the moon, the position of the stars, um, the polarized light surrounding the sun and the moon. And even it's been suggested um, gradients of light intensity, but that hasn't actually been proven yet. Additionally, scientists have also discovered what could be the presence of what's known as a wind compass in dung beetles. So as the sun approaches the top of its daily path, um, it actually becomes increasingly unreliable as a navigation clue. Um, and this is because the position of the sun on the dung beetle's retinas doesn't really change that much when it's up that high. Um, so the dung beetles instead need to take directional information, which if, av if available, they can use from the wind. So this dung beetle wind compass is really a really impressive product of evolution. Um, and it seems really beautifully matched to the habitat which it was discovered in, which is the Kalahari. And this is because when the sun is at the highest point in the day, then the wind is also the strongest. Um, even more impressive about this directional information is that it can be transferred from the wind compass to the sun compass and vice versa, each of which provides a backup for the other cue. And um, performing this little dance at the top of the ball will also help them to pick up the wind direction a lot easier. So really the navigation abilities of these ball rolling beetles are incredible. And um, I would just like to bring up this one case study, the final thing about navigation, um, which is a certain genus of tunneling dung beetle known as Pachysoma. And basically the species in this genus um, dig burrows. And from, the, from these burrows, they make multiple back and forth journeys between the food source and their burrows. And because of these two way journeys, we can actually observe a really interesting navigation behavior. So again, apologies um, here if you can't see um, the map so well on the screen, um, where it says burrow, the, line, the red line goes across to another black, line, um, black dot, which would be the dung pile. So essentially what happens with these dung beetles is when they're looking for a food source, they take a really convoluted route away from their burrow, as you can see from the wiggly black line. But once they found the food source, they move between the burrow and their food source completely directly in a straight line. So how do they know exactly where home is? And again, Marcus and his colleagues invested the, investigated this by actually displacing the food source while the dung beetles were still there and watching how this affected their ability to locate home. So one of the theories that could be true is that they could be using landmarks. And if this was the case, it would mean that even when the dung beetles were displaced at the food source, then they would still be able to find home. But what they actually found is if you displace the food source 10 centimeters to the left or right, then the dung beetle on its way home would start looking for its burrow in exactly the right distance, but about 10 centimeters off either side. So this form of navigation is known as homing path integration, and it's also been witnessed in other organisms like ants and crabs as well. So basically what the dung beetles are doing is somehow recording the exact distance from their burrow to the food source. And then by work, this could be also by working out the number of steps, except they're not exactly sure. 
Um, and then they use celestial cues to pinpoint exactly the direction and the bearing in which their burrow is located. And once you've got these two things, then you're good to go. But despite all of these investigations, um, there are still many, many questions to be answered about dung beetle navigation, which I think makes them even more intriguing. So the importance of dung beetles. Um, dung beetles aren't only fascinating, but they are also really incredibly important little animals, not only ecologically, but also economically, especially for humans, because they provide a number of ecosystem services, which are basically um, the benefits that humans can gain from a, spe a species ecological contribution. Um, and there are too many to talk about today, including pollination, which often comes as a big surprise to people, and trophic control, um, but I'm just going to talk about some really important ones for now. So a significant proportion of the nutrients that are consumed by herbivores are actually lost through defecation, and the productivity of plants is really strongly related to how well these nutrients can get back into the soil. And with dung beetles, by actually physically relocating dung below the soil surface, this can help stir up microorganism activity. Um, this is through kind of aerating the soil and increasing the soil porosity, uh, the water porosity. Um, and then these microorganisms such as bacteria can actually help with nitrogen fixing. Um, and I'm sure that you're all aware that nitrogen is hugely important for plant growth. And also burying the dung can help prevent the nitrogen being lost to the atmosphere, which improves soil fertility. And dung beetles have also been shown to increase other soil nutrients like potassium and calcium, magnesium, even influencing the soil pH, um, which are all really important for soil health and therefore plant health. But you'll hear a lot more about that in my mom's talk in a few weeks time. And seed dispersal is another really important ecosystem service that dung beetles provide. So for a seed to reach germination, it has to run a serious gauntlet but for avoiding predators and ending up in unsuitable places where conditions might not be that favorable and also that competition is really high. So from a dung beetle's perspective, they don't really care about seeds. They're not that important because they don't eat them. But because of the intense competition for dung, the dung burial usually happens really quickly. So what happens is a lot of seeds actually get planted really by the dung beetles. Um, but also dung beetles can actually clean their dung balls by purposely, purposefully removing the seeds. And then they're discarded either in the tunnels or in surface, but definitely away from where they originally started. And um, additionally to moving these seeds out of harm's way, it has also been suggested that even once the seeds are clean, they become actually quite unpalatable to predators sort of like rodents because they've been sitting in dung for a while. So <laughs> um, this drastically reduces seed predation. Um, it also helps to relocate the seeds to either more favorable um, conditions or really just helps disperse them out of the way of competition. Um, dung beetles have actually been known to move dung balls up to 15 meters away from a dung pile, which is a pretty significant distance for a seed. And as well as being an important food source for dung beetles, fresh mammal dung is also a really important resource for a variety of dung breeding, breeding flies. And fly infestations can use, cause a huge financial burden, as I'm sure many farmers know. And when the dung beetles and the flies occur together, the flies actually tend to lose out. And this is for a number of reasons. One, purely just competition for a resource. Also, as the dung beetles move around the dung and consume the dung, they can actually damage the fly larva that's buried in there, as well as changing the kind of microclimate of the dung pack and making, making that a little bit unsuitable for fly larva so that they don't survive. And another really cool thing is that dung beetles actually have a mite on them, and this mite actually predates the fly larvae as well. So the dispersal of dung by dung beetles and cattle fields also reduces something which is known as pasture fouling. And this is basically when the grass that's underneath the dung pad or even to a certain extent around the dung pad becomes really unpalatable to the animals that are within that field, which really reduces the, um, the functional grazing space that animals have. And just as an illustration of the economic benefits that dung beetles can provide to farmers. Um, in the UK, it's been estimated that dung beetles can save farmers 
over 360 million pounds a year, which is about 40 pounds a cow. So they are really incredibly important. And unfortunately, like with many other species, there are numerous factors usually caused by humans, which are causing declines in dung beetle populations. Um, and here are just some of the major ones. So ivermectin is a drug which treats internal parasites in animals, um, and more recently actually COVID in humans apparently, but it's mainly used in an agricultural sense to sort of rid livestock of worms, etc. Um, but ivermectin really doesn't get broken down that well by an animal's metabolism, and some studies have shown that actually up to 98% of each dose um, is excreted, which has serious consequences, obviously, for non-target non animals, especially dung beetles, um, given that most of them feed on dung throughout their entire life cycle. So the toxicity of ivermectin poses a huge problem. And um, ivermectin has been shown to cause a number of problems in dung beetles. Um, it causes sensory and locomotory disorders. This affects the sensing ability of the antennae with serious consequences for finding food. Um, <clears throat> and additionally, because of these issues with their antennae, it can also disrupt the way that they interpret um, sexual signals, which causes issues for finding a mate and breeding success. Um, another issue caused by ivermectin is a delay in the emergence of larvae, which is a massive problem, especially in sort of cooler climates where the dung beetles need to hi hibernate, or also in places where um, the dung resources might be a bit more seasonal, sort of like during the Great Migration. And um, when dung beetles ingest the ivermectin, it can also cause reduced mobility, which is also known as ataxia, sort of a kind of paralysis. And um, this has really long consequence, long term consequences for dung beetles that actually leads to death. And um, I don't know, I hope you can see this graph on the screen um, by a study conducted by Dr. Jose Verdu and his colleagues. Um, and it really shows that a ivermectin can have an effect even in really low doses and these effects can be seen in the long term even after 100 days after exposure and the increase in urbanized areas um, like cities which produce an incredible amount of light pollution can also cause issues for any animal that navigates with celestial cues but especially dung beetles um, this characteristic Nighttime glow, which was produced by cities, can obscure, um, obscure the visual cues that nocturnal dung beetles use to navigate, including the Milky Way and the moon, it kind of like diluting the starlight. So I'm sure you've probably all experienced the difference between the number of stars you can see when you're in the city and then when you're in the bush. Um, and light pollution in cities also causes another problem, which is that it induces a behavior called beaconing. And this is essentially where the dung beetles are drawn towards the really bright artificial lights. Um, this increases the competition between dung beetles if they all end up in the same place. And it really puts them in places where they're really unlikely to successfully bury their balls and reproduce. And they're similar to the confusion that's experienced by turtle hatchlings when they're looking for the moon. Habitat loss is another major cause of dung beetle declines, um, not only of their own habitats, but also the habitats of animals who they rely on. Um, and deforestation actually is a major contributor to habitat loss. And although we're most used to seeing dung beetles on the savannah, it's actually the forest ecosystems that are most important habitats for dung beetles. Um, there can be up to 36 times more dung beetles in forests and grasslands, and this makes their dung removal about three times more effective in forests as well. And finally, um, poaching and the resultant loss of dung producers means less resources for beetles. Um, rhino middens, like that quote that we saw earlier today, rhinos being ecosystem engineers, they're really important for a lot of other species. And elephant dung is also a major source, um, a food resource for dung beetles. Um, a single midden or um, elephant dung pile can actually contain upwards of 16,000 dung beetles. Um, so if you're ever on safari, please try not to run them over. <laughs> um, and of course, we all know the struggles of rhinos and elephants that's currently going on. 
So I'm really sorry to end on such a negative note. Um, I am a conservationist at heart, and as you well know, insects are often overlooked in terms of conservation efforts um, because really people think they're less charismatic and we assume that there's plenty of them, but that's not actually the case. Um, some species are even more endangered than rhinos. And we really do need to consider these amazing species in our conservation efforts, especially today, it being World Wildlife Day. So thank you all so much for listening. Um, I really hope you enjoyed that. I hope that maybe you learned something as well. And I look forward to hearing any of your questions. Thank you very much, Sal. That was very interesting. And my <laughs> respect for dung beetles increased tonight. <laughs> Good, that's the plan. <laughs> So before I go to the questions in the chat, I'm going to start with Judith Masters, who has a hand up. Mm -hmm. so Judith, I'm going to ask you to unmute. I just, Hi. I just want a couple of um, clarifications. So, ivermectin. Um, if people are taking this erroneously, in my view to combat COVID, is this a problem for the dung beetles? Yeah, I mean, it's a massive problem. Um, it'll be a problem really in any system where the ivermectin can get into dung that dung beetles can access, which also brings up the, probably an issue of being in less developed countries where potentially um, the like waste disposal isn't that good. Um, but really anywhere that dung beetles get exposed to ivermectin, then yes, it will be a problem for them. So in fact, the fact that the, 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 the erroneous suggestion that that's going to save people from COVID is destroying part of our biodiversity. Yeah, I mean, I would say so. I, I know that there's um, a lot of things in the world, you know, pharmaceutical countries that will be destroying parts of an ecosystem. I don't think that you can get away with it. Um, I think a really important, you know, kind of follow on from that might be to look at how ivermectin is broken down in a human's body, because really the biggest issue with using ivermectin is that it's not metabolized really in any way. I mean, it's designed to kill everything in its path, really, um, all of the internal parasites. So which is why you really do need to think about what other things that might be affecting as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. For, thank you for your question. <laughs> I just have one other question. Yeah. Um, when you produced your your um, distribution map of the scarabaeani um, and you you had a couple of uh, a line a dotted line between Africa and Madagascar and a dotted line on what I think is the Wallace line between Asia and and Australia does that mean that those are lines where the the uh, dung beetles don't cross or is that just a general biodiversity line? Yeah, so um, I just want to reiterate that I did not come up with that global distribution. Oh, no, <laughs> not that good. Um, yeah, it's um, it's that those lines actually represent the different um, the endemism. So there's a lot of places where dung beetles are endemic. So the species of dung beetles that you get there are only found there, which is why you have those lines, especially for Madagascar as well. There's a lot of endemic species in Madagascar because it's been separated as an oh, island. So they're, they're that's really what those lines good. mean. Yeah. The really good endemic species of dung beetles in Madagascar, and and mm -hmm. what are they adapted to, to eating the dung of? Um, oh, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but off the top of my um, off the top of my head, I I guess that you'd probably find a few dung beetle species that are adapted to surviving off lima dung, probably, which would be a really interesting um, study, actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because there are no other big herbivores. Yeah, exactly. Um, and now I guess with humans and all their cows, maybe the dung beetles are quite happy. But before, I'm sure it would be an interesting thing to look up, actually, um, with reference to the lemurs. So I'll, I shall have a look at that afterwards. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. 
Thank you very much, Judith. And thank you very much, Sal, for answering that. Um, in relation to that question, is this restricted to ivermectin? And what about steroids, steroids and antibiotics that's fed to cattle? Do you perhaps know anything about that? Yeah, so I mean, I don't know the specifics for sure, but it's not restricted to ivermectin at all. I think ivermectin is just really the most common drug that's used and it's used worldwide. So that's why people are starting to do studies on it. But really the studies of the effects of ivermectin have only come in in the last five, 10 years. We're only just learning about it. So there's a whole host of different things like antibiotics and like you said, steroids that we really need to look at what the effects, what effects they might be having on these non-target organisms like dung beetles. So really it's just a case probably of a bit more research, which I think people are doing as well at the moment. Yeah, especially in the past two years as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so thank you, Sandra Hardy, for that question. Thank you. Um, then let's ask Roland Hoots to unmute and ask his question. Okay, uh, first of all, just an observation, uh, well, a bit of history, and then secondly, a question. Mm -hmm. um, the whole business of predation um, by the mites uh, on the fly larva, uh, that was actually an interesting process. I, I wasn't clear at the time, because first of all, the Dung Beetle Research Institute that we were working with came from Australia because of their mm -hmm. fly problem. And uh, so they felt that the solution to their fly problem uh, was to use dung beetles because that seemed to work in Africa. Yeah. Okay. So what we, what they did was they couldn't send a lot of dung beetles across to Australia. Um, so they sent the eggs and stuff, but they didn't have the mites on them. So mm -hmm. they found in the beginning uh, that it didn't have the impact on the fly populations that they thought it would have. So they sort of went back to the drawing board and then they discovered, that team discovered that it was actually the, uh, the dung beetle was actually playing a taxi uh, to the mite. Um, and then that seemed to make a, a, a big difference. Now, my question is, uh, because then I moved from, I left from, well, obviously I had uh, not much to do with the dung beetle research institute. Uh, so I've lost sort of the track of what happened afterwards. Uh, my question is how successful was the, um, and also at that stage, I don't think they thought, but they thought that they weren't dung beetles because they weren't, weren't uh, placental mammals. And uh, I'm not sure of what the dung beetle biology is that they've discovered subsequently, but these, mainly the scarab beetles. Um, now with the mites, uh, I don't know how much work has been done afterwards, how effective has that been on trying to regulate the fly populations in Australia? And what is the current research um, in Australia with dung beetles? Yeah, thank you very much, Roland. That's a really interesting observation, actually. That's a really important point um, about the mites being really important, which just sort of highlights how you sort of need to do your research before you start bringing in things from all over the world. Um, I actually, I'm not 100% up to date with how that's all going. I did read a few papers which said that initially the studies had been quite um, quite promising in terms of the fly population. Um, but the biggest issue that you have really with importing any kind of um, non-Indigenous species is the way it will interact with everything else that exists there. Um, I know that Australia has already had a few issues with importing different things, like, for example, the rabbits and then the cane toads. Um, so I know that they will have done a lot of research on it, but unfortunately, I'm not that up to date with it. Um, I'd be more than happy to go away and research it and get back to you on that, if that's something you'd like to know, because it would be interesting for me as well to, to understand. Yeah, no, for exactly that reason. Uh, I mean, the problem was because we introduced uh, cattle in great numbers, and that led to the fly problem. And yeah. then they brought in, but quite a lot of research was done beforehand, uh, before they uh, introduced the dung beetle uh, to deal with the, the dung issue in Australia and the fly issues. Um, and at that stage, they found that it didn't seem to be doing too much, but, you know, looking back, you know, they say, you know, now we have hindsight, uh, so I'd be very interested in seeing if there was, because I'm also very concerned about uh, moving things around, human beings playing God, 
So yeah. I'd be interested to see a couple of, of years later if there was any issues uh, with dung beetles uh, in terms of the biology of Australia and also how successful it is at the moment. It, is it still going on? I mean, Absolutely. obviously the answer is get rid of the cattle, but obviously you can't do that. So <laughs> yeah. I'll be interested. Yeah. Yeah, really interested. Yeah. Well, I'd be more than happy to do some research for you and then maybe connect with you a little bit later on that and we could learn together about it. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Roland, um, and for bringing up such important points. Um, and for answering, Sal, I think you guys can share details in the chat or Marit can just email you the email address. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That would be good. I mean, I don't have that information on me right now. So I think an email address would probably be the best thing so that I can go away and find out even more about dung beetles and then get yeah. back to people for sure. Yeah, I've spoken like a true scientist. Okay, <laughs> and then we have a new question um, from Prof. Liesl van Us. So Prof, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi, Prof. Unmute. Unmute my... Right. Good evening. Okay. Thank you for, for the presentation. I really enjoy it. In Afrikaans, we have a saying, the ense do it as the onions brew it. And to translate this to English, it's one man's meat is another man's poison. So um, you focus quite a lot of the importance of the dung but what about other animals that survive on them as a food source? Can you elaborate a little bit on that? And connected to this, do you think we must actually start um, uplifting the status of dung beetles to keystone species? Yeah, well, just um, just to answer your, your latter question, absolutely I do. I mean, if you couldn't tell from my talk, I'm pretty passionate about dung beetles and really, really um, an advocate for how important they are for the environment. And if you look on the ICN, there's a lot of um, a lot of listings of different types of dung beetles that are listed as vulnerable or endangered or even critically endangered. And it's kind of, you know, I think there's a there's a big or was a big movement for um, sort of these umbrella species that we used as flagships for conservation, where they were like, yes, you know, let's let's protect the elephants and things. But I think you really need to start looking at now how we can protect entire ecosystems and everything that's involved in that, which includes dung beetles, then yes, probably as being um, a, an ecosystem, a keystone species, ecosystem engineers, all of that. And um, to answer your first question, I'm not, again, not 100% um, clued up on the issues of um, the importance of dung beetles for the things that eat them. But of course, you know, everything has its place in, um, in the ecosystem. And if the dung beetles are suffering, then of course, um, everything else will be. And there's obviously um, sort of like a, a cycle and the food chain that if you disrupt one part of that, like the dung beetles, then you'll be disrupting everything else. So um, in that way, they're really important as well. Um, I hope that answers your question a little bit, but again, maybe some more research is needed. Thank you very much, Prof. And I think, um, yeah, thank you, Sal. And I think you just answered uh, Leclo Nolo's Motohang um, TUT's question as well, in that are beetles also ecological indicators? Oh, so yeah, think, absolutely. Um, there's some, been some really incredible studies. Again, I'd be really happy to sort of point you in the, in the right direction for some really interesting papers that have been written about dung beetles as indicators, but for sure, especially within forest habitats, you know, they've been looking at deforestation and how that's affecting not only the numbers of dung beetles, but also the assemblages of dung beetles. So as I mentioned earlier, the different functional groups, dwellers, tunnelers, rollers, they all have their part and they all need to be there to play that part. You know, as soon as you have an imbalance in the different species that are there, it means that you've got an unhealthy ecosystem. So for sure, when you start seeing changes in dung beetle populations, that's a really good, you know, um, sort of a, a warning before, before things start going really wrong that maybe you need to start looking at, maybe there's not enough herbivores or the levels are changing or, Dung beetles can actually only travel so far, really. So if you've, um, even if you still seem like you've got a lot of animals within your habitat, maybe their distribution is changing. And that can also be a sign of 
you know, human disturbance or climate change. Um, and you can see that when the dung beetles as well, which is incredible. Yes. Okay, thank you, Sal. Um, and then Holly McGog. I asked you. Hi, CL. Hey. I actually. Oh, I hi, guys. <laughs> this is more of um, an observation in terms of ecological indicators because Dr. Craig Packer did studies in uh, Serengeti that showed that a dung beetle arrived at a fresh dung pile within seven seconds of that mm -hmm. animal excreting. So if we go out tomorrow and we measure in our area, how long does it take for a dung beetle to appear? And it's sort of, I would imagine here, it's in the range of two or three hours. Does that mean that our ecosystem is not in balance or what would you respond to that? Um, well, it's an interesting question. Thank you, Holly. Um, I don't Any think time, yeah. that, <laughs> I think um, that that's a difficult one to answer because like you said, you, whenever you think about a dung, you know, I mentioned earlier that a dung beetle can roll a ball 15 meters away from a dung pile, but that's not all dung beetles. So if you're expecting all dung beetles to go that distance, then you might be thinking, oh no, like the, the ecosystem's dying because all the dung beetles aren't getting far enough away. But really that's kind of a sort of a one-off. So you've got to look at what kind of species are the ones that get there first. Um, you've got to look at the the kind of the just general distribution because if you're in somewhere like the Serengeti when all the wildebeest are coming through, there'll be dung beetles everywhere because there's dung everywhere. So it might be really easy for dung beetles to get from where they're going. Um, you've got to look at the habitat, how easy it is for them to move between the habitat if they're in the forest or if they're in kind of like scrubland, then it's harder for them to fly. It's harder for the scent to travel through the air. Um, depends on the temperature, depends on the weather. So it, it may well be. That reminds me that in terms of weather, yes, because if it's dry season, how is a dung beetle going to bury underground? But if it's wet season, then the dung beetle can take that dung underground. Yeah, um, the weather definitely plays a massive part. I mean, you can, you'd can you be pretty impressed at what these guys can get through, um, depending on how hard the soil is. But also, especially for um, the tunnelers who d dig tunnels underneath the dung pats, um, that's actually can be quite helpful for them because the moisture in the, in the dung will help to soften the soil below. And I mean, some tunnelers can dig tunnels up to like three meters, I think was once measured, but usually it's only between five yeah <laughs> but then again that depends on the soil type you know um and so yeah they're just incredible but it, to go back to your first question it just really depends on so many different factors that you have to take into account which is why conservation is so incredibly difficult because you've got to take in so many factors and then if you start trying to change things you've got to think about how that's going to affect everything else so Seeing as I've got you here, Ciel, I did ask a question in the chat, which I'm now going to ask out loud, because I know yeah, a lot yeah. of farmers here in Kenya use a special medicine that they give their cows so that the flies are not attracted to the dung, because obviously they have their, their farmhouse and the other people who live on the farm and they don't want to be hoarded by flies. So <laughs> do you think, or can you come back to me later about if that medicine, and we can try and get the name of it off the people who use it, affects dung beetles? Because that would be interesting because that's a promoted dawa, a promoted medicine in dairy farmers across Africa. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I for sure I would get back to you because I didn't actually know that and I would love to learn more about it. Sounds really interesting. But I'm going to say that it probably does affect dung beetles because it seems like most things do, especially if it's sort of more artificial. You know, there could be something. I know that people use sort of pyrethrum and things in fly sprays, you know, if you're using it on your horses or your cows and it's more natural. And I don't know what effect that might have on dung beetles. But if it's sort of a manufactured pharmaceutical, then um, I would guess that it probably is having some effect. Might, might, might not be negative because actually in some cases with ivermectin, um, which is really is just adding insult to injury, it actually makes dung more attractive to dung beetles in certain species. And then they eat it and then they die. So um, okay, it'll be so interesting then, to find out that. And at least for the audience, I have walked over these 
these dairy farms and there are still a lot of dung beetles in the dung so mm -hmm. unless it's got that ivermectin oh shit uh thing then mm -hmm. i think <laughs> we shall see wait i have another question while you're here how long because <laughs> you mentioned that sometimes they they only reproduce once a year what's their lifespan yeah you know i so knew someone was gonna ask you this question and i thought to myself i better look up how long dung beetles live so that i can answer that <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like I said, there are obviously um, there are some dung beetles that don't live for very long, um, like maybe even just one year or just throughout a single season, maybe six months, depending on their breeding cycle. But for sure, I'm sure you could get dung beetles living up to two years or maybe more, because like I said, some of them only breed within one cycle. But I will have to double check that for you and for myself, because I'm kicking myself that I didn't actually look it up properly. I should know that. But thank you for that question. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, we're going to come back on you on that because I know that there's been incredible um, research on spiders that live 67 years, wow. the longest known spider. So if a spider can live that long, how long does a dung beetle live? So yeah, gonna... I mean, I was I would say probably they would live even up to five years or longer. I was just sort of covering my back because I don't want to make things up, but I would I would imagine they could live up to five years probably. Um, so let's see. We should we should look it up and then we'll we'll find out. Yeah. Good scientist. Well done, Ciel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> um, yeah. In with regard to um, insects, I know that I read that they are the strongest. They might not live the longest, but they are the strongest. Am I right? Yes, they are. Um, I think um, Marat was asking me um, about about this because she was putting it up on the advertisement for just a few facts about dung beetles um, and they can lift something like what would be the equivalent of a thousand times their body weight with some of the balls that they drag around so yeah they're pretty strong and like Chris was saying earlier when you watch the fights that these guys have and they can honestly kick their component up to like nearly half a meter like they really go flying so they're super strong <laughs> so they get that award <laughs> okay thank you <laughs> Um, and then Sibyl Reedmiller asked, why is navigation so important for the dung beetles? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I suppose scientists spend a lot of time working out the why of things. Um, and sometimes you'll never be able to really know. It's just kind of the way that evolution has gone. But I think the biggest thing for dung beetles will have been the competition for dung resources. Um, and mm. essentially they need to get away from the dung pile as quickly as possible. And like I said, the best way to do that is in a straight line. So they sort of do need to be able to have these navigation techniques so they don't just end up going in a circle, especially when you're rolling a ball as well. I imagine that the physics probably contributes a little bit to where you're going. You need to make sure you stay on the same course. Um, but just again, and that's something else to research and look up, but I would imagine that it's a lot to do with the competition. Um, there might be some other things as well. Oh, thank you very much, Marette, for posting that TED talk in the chat because it's very interesting. And maybe you might find the, um, the answer in that one as well. So I would encourage everyone to have a look at it for sure. Mm. No, that is very well answered, so, Um, They can't see very well, no? Oh. So well, I suppose it, they... it, um, it depends on your definition of see. It's very much like a lot of different insects. You wouldn't say they can see like humans can see, but they can see a lot that we can't see. Um, yeah. And with their tiny little eyes, they are actually able to pick up um, the polarized light and um, the light that's given off by the stars somehow. Um, they sort of have kind of compound eyes, which a lot of insects have. I think that helps as well. Um, but for sure, whatever light that cities give off, um, that definitely dilutes the light enough so that they can't see them. So it's probably, they're super hypersensitive eyes, but that obviously mean that they probably get um, quite distracted by artificial light as well. So I think they're very tailored to what they're designed to look at. Yeah, and you answered this earlier because I was going to ask you is that they use the sense of smell to find the dung or? Yeah, yeah, so they use, they can use a scent, well, it's essentially a sense of smell, yeah, it's kind of the, the picking up of the pheromones, which the dung releases, yeah, oh, interesting. like what the volatile compounds and things, it's also how they locate their burrows as well, because I also mentioned a little bit about their scent marking their burrows, actually, um, the tunnelers do, which is cool. Oh, cool, okay, thank you, and then um, this is the last question I find in the chat, 
from Cheryl Ogilvy is, why do they walk backwards with their face to the ground? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they're probably asking themselves the same question, thinking this is really not a very efficient way of getting around. But actually, it is seemingly the most efficient way of getting around because they've got um, those strong back legs. There are actually so um, the Pachysoma species that I was talking about earlier, the ones with the um, homing path integration, they actually drag they, if they collect pellets and sometimes tiny little dung balls and they actually drag them behind them. Um, but then I think maybe it's just a, a less convenient way of doing it, because if you're pushing something, then I suppose it's sort of rolling it with its own momentum, as opposed to pulling something where you're kind of dragging it through the ground and it's easier for it to get caught on anything and whatever. And maybe if you end up going over a cliff or something and then you'll be squashed by your ball, unless it's going first, in which case you can just let it go okay. and follow <laughs> after it. Okay, no, that makes sense. And that's very true. <laughs> Um, there was just a uh, fun. You had your hand up. I'm not sure if your question was answered. Hi there. First of all, yeah, thank you for a fantastic, fantastic uh, presentation hey, from thank a you. fellow dung beetle researcher. Uh, oh, really? It, That's amazing. Uh, all the other things. And um, you're mentioning the Pachysoma, actually, one of my favorite groups. Those are probably the most interesting, interesting beetles. Yeah, um, well, I'm on the eastern side of South Africa, so we don't have many of them. That's a sort of West Coast special for us and a fantastic thing. Um, sorry, my hand is up, not so much for a question, but to help uh, Roland um, with his Australia question that he asked earlier on there. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. I'd love to know more it's, about that as well. It's actually been very successful. Uh, one of our very, very common and widespread species, um, the Copris alphanor. I think everybody in this group has probably seen one of those at some point in their lives and uh, might not know it by name, um, but it's a small little black ones with the very distinctive um, sort of horn. Um, mm -hmm. and they, they're the South African representatives. There have been a couple of species also from France that they've uh, imported to Australia. Um, so it's sort of like a multi-continental effort. Um, the, the, the biggest problem at the moment is the coppice often, or even though it's very common, a lot of these dung beetles, like you said, they are habitat specialists, mm -hmm. uh, and they don't really move very far. Uh, you, you'd expect them to fly hundreds of kilo kilometers and be able to spread very easily. And they actually don't, they, they tend to find a habitat with the right soil type and everything fits nicely and then they stay there. Yeah. So Australia's like biggest challenges at the moment is actually the distribution um, is to facilitate that distribution of these beetles. And it's, it's very difficult. You can't just go chucking jars and jars of, of beetles everywhere. So it's a, it's yeah. a very going <laughs> process, but it's nonetheless, it's still uh, in operation. And those even quite a few decades later, it's, it's still quite an amazing project. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you so much for that. That was really interesting. It's nice to know more about it. And also, I like your name. It's a good name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> spelled right. Yes, thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Good presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Vaughan. Um, Aisha, I see Marty is waving his hand. I think he's just saying hi, bye. Uh, any questions, Marty? <laughs> I, I, my hand's been up for a while already. It should have popped to the top of your participants. So. <laughs> but I think it's the, the, a camouflage in the dung that I've got behind me. Yeah. <laughs> Very you impressed see. with your background. Thank you. <laughs> no, thanks. So um, you might have noticed, um, and it's funny that Aisha pointed it out at the beginning because uh, I always do it. But this time I had lots because I'm uh, mad about dung beetles. I, I really do love them. And I've oh, actually. Good. I've um, listened to Marcus's talk at Wits Live and a few other times, I think about three or four times. So, um, oh, really? I must say, You've listened to it live? That's yeah. incredible. I'm very jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so I must say you did an awesome job this evening and you did even teach us some new facts that he, he didn't teach us. Um, so well done. And Marcus Thank needs you. to watch out. There's a, a competitor coming close by. <laughs> like, <laughs> like a dung beetle, you're going to fling him. <laughs> thank you marty no it was awesome uh, i just wanted to ask you, you you see the picture behind me um on top of my shoulder yep. there's that little green guy compared yep. to the big black guys and i was just interested um most of them i, I don't know 
maybe 80, 90% are all black. And then there's this green guy. Is there a reason that he's green? I mean, he's also a dung beetle. Um, is, is there a specific reason that he, he's changed color and he's also a lot smaller than the other ones? Maybe you can teach us some more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the size that I can probably um, probably explain is usually just to do what with what kind of type they are. So I imagine that one is probably a dweller. The color actually is a really interesting question. Um, I perhaps should have thought about looking it up because really I, I know there is a reason why they're different colors, but I have no idea. Maybe we could maybe even ask Vaughn if he knows the answer, if, if he's got any, any more wisdom to impart. But unfortunately, I really don't know the reason. Um, I would love to know though. So I, I will look it up unless Vaughn can tell us more. Yeah, well, well, this is the opportunity possible. to gain some ground. <laughs> Come on in and tell us. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so pleased I'm not giving this presentation. You have an audience that come up with the most amazingly difficult questions. Hey? <laughs> uh, They're good questions. Um, actually, generally speaking, if you look at a lot of those, uh, the, the greens, and the, in, especially in South Africa, we have this huge, uh, a very wide range in temperature. Um, so we sort of established that the temperature does have a really big effect on the colorful ones. So those the green ones, the creative can actually be in gymnopleurus is also beautifully colored yeah. and within the same species you can actually find a huge variation all the way from blues through to greens to coppers within the same species which makes um you can't really identify the beetles just based on their color alone but uh, the one thing that a lot of those things have in com common is um activity periods the black ones tend to be uh, nocturnal and those very brightly colored ones tend to be a lot more diurnal species um, but like with everything in nature, never say never. Hey, you'll find mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of black species operating in the daytime and uh, sometimes even the, the colorful ones at night. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a lot. There, there is a lot of research being done and a lot of um, connections made between that color and mate attraction, for example. Yeah, uh, that was going to be my next question. So, Do you so, think it yeah, would be yeah. anything... Oh, sorry. Um, would it be anything then to do with like thermoregulation, that iridescence, if if it's to do with activity periods? Do you think? Could be. Could be. Um, what we well, you, that's that's a whole study of. That's why I said these are very tough questions. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry. Now I'm asking you questions. It's, it's, it's a lot of people still busy scratching around and trying to uh, scratching their heads and trying to figure that out. Um, the temperature gradient and that seems to be in the larval development stage. So yeah. that's that's when they it's sort of depending on the temperature it depends on whether it's going to be a green or more of a blue sh shine to it or even the bronze coloring. Um, but for what particular purpose, I think it might also just be an effect more than a, a cause. And then I think yeah, and, and I mean in terms of the um, the color, is it like that its whole life, or does it change? Um, I mean, is it literally the same the whole time because obviously yeah, there's well, a once, it's a, once it's an adult that's mm -hmm. so that's what i'm saying as a as a larvae or as a grub it'll it'll be exposed to those temperatures and then as an adult it will stay the same color throughout no cool thanks a lot i'll look forward to your um research paper on the colors and invite me <laughs> along uh, i'll come help you <laughs> <laughs> but yes but you will never stop <laughs> well done, my man keep going <laughs> All right, this Holly has got a hand up again. Holly McGock, let's see what's coming up this time. Or you, is, is your hand just still up since the previous question? No, definitely not. So I don't know if this is for UCL or for Vaughan, but in <laughs> terms of colors of dung beetles, and we've spoken about you know thermoregulation or activity, but you know how in birds like tourisin is specific. Um, feather color of Taracos. How does the color emerge in dung beetles? Is it the distribution of keratin and air bubbles in the scarab, or how does that color come about? Holly, you are asking me questions that yeah, I do not she's... know the answers to. You. <laughs> like she's the whole team there, you know, phone a friend, and they're sitting there playing. Yeah. <laughs> If, if we, um, could, we could probably phone a few friends and they would they would ask us what are we drinking tonight because these, uh, <laughs> these questions are amazing 
<laughs> yeah, Cheryl Ogilvy is just mentioning that some are pink in Dumo. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, wow, so that's just wanna, really incredible. Cheryl and Vaughan, I, I think that the fact that Holly asked the question and there's no answer forthcoming, Holly, will you please find the answer and then let the rest of them know, okay? <laughs> Stop yeah, good it. plan. Yeah. Holly, you're in charge of researching that one. <laughs> listen to a podcast about it. <laughs> All right, I'll listen to a podcast. <laughs> Maybe Ruth want to jump in on this one. Ruth, you are... Oh, here we, yeah, here we go. Here we go. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, Sieli. Hi, Mama. <laughs> Hi. Do you think that the pesticide use in agriculture has a big impact on the... Um, population of dung beetles? Yes, yes I do. Um, I think any kind of chemical use is really bad for not just dung beetles, kind of any insects, which um, I know that you know because I know you're a big advocate for soil health and improving it from the ground up instead of the top down, um, but for sure and it would be really interesting to have a look at the effects of different types of pesticides and how they influence different dung beetles. Um, but then again, it's also dependent on exposure. So it depends what kind of farming you're doing. If you're doing sort of mixed, you know, arable and also pastoral, so you've got your cows and your, um, and your crops all in the same place, then whether it's a case of the pesticides being transferred sort of through the air or a case of the pesticides that you put on your land that the cows then eat and how that would affect the dung beetles when it comes out the other side is also a really interesting thought. So, but either way, I'm sure that it's not good news, unfortunately. So there's a whole new study coming up. And can I have one last question, please? <laughs> I'll ask Aisha, she's in charge. <laughs> yes, Aisha, can I have one last question? <laughs> okay. We saw a picture of a very compacted soil where the dung beetle, where the, the soil, the top surface was really cracked. So that's a saline, sort of very saline soil. So the soil compaction, that must have a big impact on the dung beetles and their ability to dig, the ones that dig and bury everything. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, um, you know, the, the dung beetles are incredibly strong. <laughs> there goes Monty. Um, dung beetles are really incredibly strong, so they can actually get through probably a lot harder soil than most people would think. But for sure, issues with potentially climate change as well, with changing rainfall patterns, and that affects how compacted the ground is and how dry the ground is. Um, that is that's a massive issue for um, for dung beetles. I actually, um, learned a little bit about that for um, my thesis when I was looking at the environmental effects and different soil types as well, because when the rain and the combinations of the rain and the temperature um, can also affect different soil types differently. So depending on which area you're in and which soil types you have in that area can mean, you know, more or less troubles for dung beetles when the climate changes and gets hotter. So for sure. Okay. Ruth, does that answer? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Aisha, can you hear me now? Sorry, I'm yes, used to it. I can hear you again. Yes, that's a very good answer. Am I allowed one more question? <laughs> sure. You can find it in my room. Like yeah. Dung <laughs> We're running out of dung beetles, and I used to grow a whole lot of doodoos when I worked for Doodoo Tech. Insects, sorry, insects when I worked for Doodoo Tech. <laughs> Um, is there a capacity for us to grow like dung beetles in captivity and then release them back into the environment, do you think, to, um, to correct the ecosystem imbalance? Yeah, that's it's a really interesting point, actually. Um, for, for those of you that don't know, the company that my mom used to work for, um, they did integrated pest management, which was breeding ladybirds, to which they then released to eat aphids. Um, which was, I imagine breeding ladybirds is probably a lot easier than breeding dung beetles because they've got a much more complex life cycle and they've got to have some pretty, um, some pretty uh, specific conditions. And I think also in terms of like, you wouldn't just put a dung beetle in a tank with another dung beetle and go make babies, you know, they've got to 
find a dung pile and then they've got to have the instinct to make a dung ball and then they've got to find a mate so that you know maybe maybe there is for sure there's definitely certain species which I'm sure maybe um the dwellers or even the tunnelers where you could just sort of plonk them there and send them on their way but I think ball rollers would probably be a bit more difficult but if that is the case I mean sign me up maybe that can be my new career choice I can be a dung beetle farmer <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're Ruth. welcome. <laughs> thanks. Th thanks, I can Ruth. Imagine. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Over to you, Aisha. Sorry. And I can just almost imagine that that setup would have to be outside of the laboratory if the navigation is all environmental. Yeah, that's external really interesting. Stimulus. Yeah, really interesting point. Actually, I was I was imagining it in a in a lab situation, but there's no reason where potentially you couldn't sort of cordon off a big area much like you have sort of cows in a field and just be like nope sorry this is my dung beetle field and then just yeah. plonk a few dung pats everywhere because like Vaughan mentioned they actually don't move that far really so you could keep them all quite contained so potentially and then yes they'd be able to see the sky and carry out all their navigation using the celestial cues so for sure that would be an option good point yeah and you said the barrows are about three meters down Oh, no, no, no. I mean, that's like record, um, depending okay. on the soil type. But usually it's it, usually it's a lot smaller, like within the within half a meter, I would probably say. Um, mm -hmm. Although now I'm worried that I've got people <laughs> who know more than me that are checking all my facts. But um, I'm pretty sure that's right. Yeah. No, no. Very well answered. That, Thanks, he doesn't have the answer either. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've got another question from Andrew Jackson. I didn't see that. Sorry, I didn't see your hand up. Oh, no worries. Uh, just a question. How specific are the different species with regards to uh, dung that they prefer? Um, uh, it's a two-part question uh, and consistency of the dung. I, I recently came back from the, from the Kalahari and I was sitting with a part of lions that actually witnessed uh, one lioness defecate a nice solid a fecal matter and then another one have a, a very very loose stool and the amount of dung beetles that are attracted to the one that uh, had the the, the the runny tummy for lack of a better word were probably 10 to 15 times compared to okay. compared to the one of the very you know or quite a solid stool so are they attracted to different dense you know different types of dung obviously species wise and also the consistency of the dung itself yeah, absolutely. And I can see that Vaughan's unmuted himself there, so I'm sure he's got a lot more to say. But for sure, there's definitely a lot of specialization when it comes to different tongue, dung types and also the different um, the moisture of the moisture content of different dung types as well. Um, but I would have said that that would vary um, between different species that would be more specialized to different dung types. But it could well be that there's a difference um, between species. And I'm going to let Vaughan maybe answer that one for you. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Uh, Andrew, uh, good seeing you here. Um, definitely. We've, uh, like in the low felt uh, where I'm based, we, we literally have uh, species where they can be overly abundant and then suddenly there's no more just based on a fence where you have access to large mega herbivores, for example, and then uh, a road or a fence or barrier and then nothing else on the other side there which is not compatible with those with those species so there's there's quite a, a quite a, a big diversity a lot of differences between the different obviously ruminants and the hindgut fermenters as well as the carnivores there's three completely different um, sort of sets of of species of dung beetles that will that will be attracted to that to that dung and then also the soil types very very important we you were discussing a little bit earlier on the spot on um, but the soil types can actually deter or encourage uh, dung beetles so you have in the Kalahari you'll find you have a lot of those uh, scarabaeus the deep soil um, diggers and they're the ones that make those really long tunnels down and uh, if they don't have that deep soil to tunnel in they just go looking for it elsewhere so those, those requirements, they actually become super sensitive species then uh, with regard to insects. Uh, they, can, they can be very specialist. Awesome, thanks so much. Thank you for the question and thank you Vaughn and Salvan for the answer. <laughs> but thanks for uh, again,
Ciel, for coming in, uh, saving our bacon. You're very welcome. <laughs> I'm telling you, for somebody who's done a master's, you are very, very, very uh, clued up and already like a scientist thinking that way and doing the right thing. I was, you, I'm very impressed. Well thank done. Thank you 